a merrier Christmas bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. Dickens refers to food and drink over 5,000 times. Dickens looked around him, I think, and looked at the extreme contrast you could see in Victorian London at the time. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. None of the others have the fire of A Christmas Carol, and I think it's because A Christmas Carol was written with such an intention. It was written to change the world. I think one of the things um, you've got to remember at this point is he's very conscious of who his audience are. I think there's probably the sense that uh, Turkey was a sort of a sort of goose on steroids. <laughs> you know, it was the sort of the next best thing up. I think the interesting thing about Dickens was he is a full-on performer. Make up the fires and buy another Cold scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, Great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long weaves of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. Welcome back to Inimitable, the podcast brought to you by the Charles Dickens Museum. This is our final instalment of season one, so I hope you've enjoyed the journey so far. Today, as you'll have heard that wonderful reading by Simon Callow, we are talking about food, food and drink, how Dickens uses it in his literature, what it means to him and what it meant to his readers. But before we get into that, I want to take just a moment to think about who Charles Dickens was when he wrote A Christmas Carol in 1843. Most of you, when you think of Charles Dickens, you probably picture the old man with the big bushy beard looking rather sinister or rather serious in a black and white photo. Now, of course, that is the man Charles Dickens would become, but he was so much more than that. When he wrote A Christmas Carol, he was just over 30. He was a young man with a full head of hair and clean-shaven face. He didn't, in fact, have his beard at this point. So before we get into the story itself, I want to find out a bit more about Dickens as a man when he was writing A Christmas Carol. To find out more, I spoke to Dr Frankie Kubitsky and Emma Harper, curators at the Charles Dickens Museum, as well as Dr Cindy Chagru, the museum director. So we've got in front of us something that we call the Lost Portrait, which we'll go into in a little bit. But it's a portrait of Charles Dickens as quite a young man. He's 31. Uh, and he looks rather quite dashing and handsome. And it was part painted by Margaret Gillies. And this is him just as an emerging literary star. And we know that it was written in a very precise period in the six weeks where he was writing A Christmas Carol. It was lost for over 170 years, really, and miraculously turned up just in a box of trinkets as part of a house sale in South Africa in 2017 and unfortunately was quite damaged at that point, had a layer of mould on it, and since been uh, conserved. And the museum, uh, once we learnt about it, and we'd had it verified that this was the, the genuine article, we did a fundraising campaign to try and bring it into the collection because it's such a unique portrait of Dickens as a young man. We got contacted by um, a fantastic miniature expert called Emma Rutherford, who was doing the first kind of groundwork on this image and actually she got in touch with us because we hold a selection of letters that Gillies wrote at the time to Dickens and from Dickens about sitting for this portrait um, and she amazingly identified that it was an important portrait because actually then it was covered in mould 
So the face was disfigured and it was quite hard to tell who the sitter was, even though she knew that it was something of, of great importance. Um, and so from her own work, trying to research this image, work out who the sitter was, what significance it was, she worked out that actually it probably ended up in South Africa through the descendants of Gillies. What's lovely from our perspective as well is that it is a painter, a painting by a female artist, Margaret mm. Gillies. And she knew Dickens, she was sort of part of Dickens's circle. She was living with um, uh, Dr Thomas Southwood Smith, who was investigating child poverty and things like this. And he sent his report to Dickens um, to sort of try and help help Dickens in his own sort of charitable work and trying to convince people that something needed to be done about the terrible situation of, of the poor uh, in Victorian England. I mean, this is it, because I think what you can see within the eyes of Dickens, and I think the thing that stands out about this portrait is his eyes, mm. um, is a real determination. And I yeah. think that is what sums up this period mm. for Dickens. He's decided that he really wants to challenge child poverty and child labour, um, driven by Southwood Smith's research into the conditions of child labourers in the mines. And he decides he has to do something. Originally, he decides it's going to be a pamphlet. Then he decides, actually, I'll have more reach as a creative story. But to do that, he has to get it done, you know, in this short period so it can be published for Christmas. And I love this portrait because I think it shows you that determination. It, yeah, it really is a challenge. You know, he looks... He looks nice and friendly, etc. But there's something in the eyes mm. that says, "Come on, what are you going to do about this?" Yeah, yeah. There's a real fire there, isn't yeah. there? And it's remarkable because I do think that a lot of people who aren't quite as familiar with Charles Dickens—I mean, everyone knows his name. Everyone kind of probably knows his image, but they probably know the old man, mm. the man with the big bushy beard and a black mm. and white photo. I mean, this is nothing like that image of Dickens. He's young, he's clean shaven, and as you say, he's got that real sense of ambition behind his eyes there, hasn't he? And the luscious locks. And the luscious locks, which <laughs> are just go beautiful, aren't they? I always think as well, they're very crinkled around the fringe, around the eye, and I always imagine him kind of playing with his fringe as he writes. <laughs> yes, I mean, Dickens and his hair could be a whole other podcast, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, Dickens, as we've said, he's a young man in this portrait, and we know from some of his letters that he was up to the things that young men and women usually get up to. We have a letter where he's talking about how he came back dead drunk at one in the morning and had to be put to bed by his missus. And I particularly like that in the next line he talks about another party that he's about to go to. So Dickens was a bit of a party animal there. I think that's so true. I think the interesting thing about Dickens was he is a full-on performer. <laughs> um, so he was known for doing impersonations, he was known for being very witty and very funny, very charming. At this point in their lives, he himself and his brilliant wife Catherine just loved dancing and going out to balls and hosting people and being these sort of really sociable young things. And I think from this letter, it's a lovely moment in their lives. They've just got married and um, they're really enjoying themselves and doing what you can do best during the festive season. Oh yes, I mean Dickens and his wife Catherine loved entertaining and being entertained. So even here in Doughty Street as a very young couple, they were hosting gatherings, celebrations, dinners, soirees, um, you know, drinks and supper after the theatre. They loved bringing people together and Dickens was this larger than life character, full of fun. He loved entertaining people. Um, you know, food and drink was part of that entertainment, but he also, you know, singing songs, telling stories, telling some of his own stories. Um, and he was often described as the person that when he came into the room, it lit up. He just was charismatic, funny, you know, an, an actor um, loved to be the centre of attention <laughs> and wouldn't disappoint. He would, you know, um, perform, as it were, in front of that audience, but bringing people together, um, you know, around around drinks, around supper, some good cheer was absolutely one of the things that, you know, sort of conveyed him from day to day. You know, he, he, he needed people around him. He needed to be with people, to observe people, to be in life and enjoying life and, and experiencing the darker sides of life as well because all of that fueled his his novels. It was part of his creative process, was being out and in and amongst people. 
I really love thinking about Dickens at this point in his life. This really does feel like the man who wrote A Christmas Carol, someone who loves to party, loves to entertain. But food was clearly important to Dickens. He uses it in all of his stories. So I wanted to find out a bit more about what would Dickens have ate himself and what would his family be used to eating? Dickens, of course, is someone who experienced a lot of different social positions in his life. And how would his diet have been influenced by that? To answer these questions, I spoke to Penn Vogler, author of Dinner with Dickens and academic advisor to the Charles Dickens Museum. I'd written about food in Jane Austen's work that I found fascinating. And Jane Austen puts in tiny little mentions of food. You have to really tease out the meaning of it. And it was like eating a massive, wonderful meal after being really hungry to come across Dickens and his way of talking about food, because he's so generous with his descriptions, both of food, but also the meaning of it, the emotional meaning of it, the kind of economic and social meaning of it. And I just thought, wow, what an incredible amount of raw material here to kind of explore what was going on both in Dickens' life and in kind of Victorian life as a whole through the way he writes about it. I found that looking at food and cooking and recipes particularly, that, that, that was my kind of way in, was that getting a recipe which might have very, very little kind of chat or matter about it. But you start by thinking, OK, where do these ingredients come from? Who's written the recipe? Who have they written it for? Um, and who's going to eat the end result? And it starts to unpick a huge kind of network of kind of power, responsibility, as well as kind of fun and conviviality. And that's so much what Dickens is writing about as well, is about how we kind of connect to each other, how people manipulate each other, um, starve each other, feed each other it, with food and emotionally as well. And so it tells you so much about his life, but also so much about his society. And I think, I wonder, you know, you mentioned talking about the recipes of Dickens's time and recipe books. Well, of course, Dickens' wife, Catherine, herself wrote a cookbook. Um, do you know, could you tell us a bit about her, her recipe book? What's in it? Catherine Dickens must have had quite a tough time as a housekeeper because Dickens was so involved in every kind of minutiae of the, of the kind of running of the house and the household. But she impressively managed to carve out this niche for herself because she published a book um, called What Shall We Have for Dinner? Uh, the paper trail for it is quite scanty. We, we're pretty sure it's by her. Her son mentions it in his memoirs, but Dickens doesn't really mention it. She wrote it under a pseudonym, Lady Maria Clutterbuck, which was a role that she played in some kind of Christmas fun. And um, But what it does is it's a series of menus that she gives for numbers of people. So they're sort of cosy, quite uh, kind of modest family meals with lots of padding, um, for two or three people and it goes right up to dinners menus suggestions for meals for between 14 and 20 people where you might have six sort of different courses lots of lobsters and oysters um, lots of kind of food that's been cooked in different ways and this is what's really interesting she was clearly a very canny housekeeper she realized if you're trying to get a dinner in a smallish modern uh, modern then but urban kitchen she realised that you needed some foods to go on the top of the stove, some to go in the stove, some to be cold, some to be waiting. So she had a very real sense of what it really took to produce, you know, what looked like a kind of effortless dinner for the lavish entertaining that Dickens started to enjoy to do. Really fascinating. And I love this idea that she's really thinking about the cook. You know, it gives you the night sense that she knows her way around a kitchen, which you know, lots of women of her position wouldn't necessarily, you know, if you live in a household with staff. Do you know anything about who the book was written for? Is she writing for sort of the urban middle class? I think she's very much writing for people like herself, the urban middle class, um, who are starting to entertain in a way that has never really happened in that kind of middle class society before. Um, they're, they, and Dickens is a really good example of this, somebody who comes from quite a modest background. I mean, his friends didn't really know quite how modest, um, and is establishing for themselves a kind of a social status. And food is so much an important part of that social status. And there's a very, very funny letter from Jane Carlyle, wife of um, Thomas Carlyle. And they are invited to dinner and she's saying, oh, it's so unbecoming, all this display 
you know, all these kind of funny little kind of flower arrangements and fake flowers and things on the table. Not, not, she says it's unbecoming for a literary man. So obviously Dickens's friends felt that, or some of his friends felt that he should be a little bit more modest in the way he entertained. But clearly the way he entertained was incredibly important to him as a way of two things. I think status is always important, but for him, because he had such this miserable childhood, bringing people together, particularly male friends together for him, was a really kind of significant emotionally. It's something, the, the idea of being able to share food because it's lovely, it's delicious, it tastes wonderful, but having the conviviality of a kind of table full of friends, I think gives him some kind of kind of emotional um, and sort of psychological happiness, really, mm. that he really felt was missing in his childhood. Yeah. And he writes about it so much. I mean, David Copperfield obviously is, you know, the most kind of autobiographical of his novels. And it's really extraordinary how a lot of the little passages in David Copperfield are very similar to the scraps of autobiography that he wrote and gave to John Forster. And so he writes in David Copperfield about being quite hungry and looking at a pineapple in Covent Garden, looking at venison in the window of a, um, of a butcher's probably, and then trying to figure out how to kind of husband his own tiny, tiny little pennies, his little resources, and knowing that he should be sensible, but he's a child, and so he spends his money on stale cake because he just wants something sweet and nice and a treat. Absolutely, we've all been there. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I guess that you've touched something really interesting there. Dickens was someone who, through his life, experienced really so many different worlds you know he was born into a, a lowly middle class family he became quite poor he then became comfortably middle class and then ended up being <laughs> fairly rich how would that have shaped his his diet could you give us a sense of what he would have been eating throughout the different periods of his life one of the really fantastic things about having Catherine Dickens's menu book is because we know from that more or less what Dickens ate or at least aspired to eat and um, Charlie, their oldest son, said, looking back, he said, um, the reception of the book was kind of well enough, but most people thought that no man could thrive on so much toasted cheese. <laughs> so obviously Dickens had, was a fan of toasted cheese. And um, we know from his writing that he, he gets gifts of food. He thank, thanks people for gifts of things like turkeys, a cake. Um, Charlie Dickens was born on 12th night on the 6th of January and his godmother gave him a massive 12th cake every year from then on. Um, so we know about the sort of quite grand sort of solid Victorian food that he would have eaten but he also for very very unusually for a man of his status and uh, at the time he knew what happened in the kitchen. He knew how to produce food so there's this fantastic little passage in um, in Dombey and Son where Captain Cuttle kind of rescues Florence and makes her a, a dinner. And he's got a fowl on a piece of string in front of the fire. And he is, he's got three saucepans on the go and he's making her eggs, he's making her gravy, he's frying her some sausages and it's all completely delicious. And of course, he's got no oven. Everything is just a fire. And he, he manages to kind of juggle all his pots and pans in front of uh, in front of the fire and that was very realistic for a lot of families at the time and Dickens would have understood that and Dickens would have understood what it was like to live somewhere and have no cooking facilities whatsoever you have to buy all your stuff from a barrow not a shop because you probably couldn't afford it um, or you know if you've got a few pennies if you've got a few extra pennies then maybe a kind of a, a tavern or a pub of some kind that's really interesting. And again, it just really changes the way you think about the era, doesn't it? You know, when you think about people living in homes and not having basic cooking facilities, you know, not having an oven, it's so strange. And, um, and it relates, I guess, to Dickens's most famous story of all, A Christmas Carol. And, and I'm always struck by the fact, of course, Martha comes back to the Cratchit family um, with the goose having been cooked in the baker's. Um, so I suppose that would have been a common way of, of sort of getting your meat if you were poor in the Victorian era. Getting anything, because you, the Cratchits would not have had an oven like most kind of poor or kind of even sort of semi-poor families at the time. And they had to send things to the bakers, so send their pies or their meat or their roasts or their joints to the bakers to be cooked. 
And in fact, if you think about patter cake, patter cake, baker's man, you prick the the pie or the or the cake with a P, and that's to mark it. That's your cake. So you go and go back to the oven. You say my cake is the one with a P on it. So yes, I mean ovens were coming into domestic houses then uh, in the kind of when Dickens started to kind of you know have his own house and be entertained and. Um, I'm sure he and Catherine had one. They'd have had a big cast iron range or a stove. And they did get more sophisticated as the time went on. But it was quite common for poor people just not to have anything at all. Or if you had a slightly bigger, earlier in the century, if you had a bigger house, and particularly in kind of rural areas, you'd have what's called a beehive oven, which is literally the shape of a beehive. It's quite thick clay. You heat it with some fuel inside rake the fuel out and then you have to time everything so it's a hot oven you put in your pies your bread and as it cools you put in other things as you know which need a lower temperature so you have to really know your oven and how to it took a lot of skill a lot of experience i think what's really fascinating about hearing Penn talk about Dickens's diet and the way he uses food is it gives you this sense that Dickens understands not just cooking but the family and the dynamics of the family and I think in many ways this is what made his stories so powerfully relatable to his audiences at the time. We think of Dickens as a historical writer because he was based in the Victorian times but of course Dickens was writing about his society he wasn't a historical novelist he was writing about as it were the modern world. And by using food and cooking and references to the natural domestic life, it made his stories very relatable to ordinary working people. But I'm fascinated to know more about Christmas, particularly. A Christmas Carol, of course, has had this enormous impact on how we celebrate Christmas, and in particular, what foods we eat. So I wanted to find out what did people eat before Christmas, and how does that change with Charles Dickens's publication of A Christmas Carol? Here's Penn Vogler. Yes, there's de- there's definitely specific meats that I had, not at Christmas particularly, but around Christmas time. Um, and one of the things that Christmas Carol does, it sort of anchors these foods to that particular day. Whereas before Victorian times, Christmas time was a much sort of longer celebration. And really what it was, was it was the church and the agricultural year kind of getting together and going, okay, what do we need to do to make sure all our food is husbanded around the year? So you eat meat at the end of a season when it's fat and healthy, um, but it was in the agricultural year, you don't want to have too much livestock to compete with humans for grain over the winter. And so some you leave and some you eat. And um, when going back to Anglo-Saxon times, a bead calls November blood months because that's when you start to slaughter your your cattle or your sheep or your pigs or whatever it is. And and so everybody would have probably had meat around Christmas, but what you had depended a lot on your status. Venison was very lordly. It was very aristocratic. It was a real statement of kind of, you know, who you were. Roast beef, the roast beef of old England was what everybody aspired to in the kind of middling yeoman classes. And beef is fascinating because beef, roast beef and plum pudding are what you have at Christmas, but they're also what you give us a charitable gift. There's this very funny bit at the end of Great Expectations. Pip goes to his village where he feels wealthy and he says, I promised myself I would do something for them, meaning the villagers, one of these days, and formed a plan in outline for bestowing a dinner of roast beef and plum pudding, a pint of ale and a gallon of condescension upon everybody in the village. And that wasn't uncommon. You know, if you wanted to kind of show your your kind of patronage to a whole village or even a family or even sometimes a thousand people, if you're the king or something, you roast an ox or you roast some beef and you have some plum pudding and people eat them together. And that's a kind of very standard thing. And then if you're a bit lower than that, goose, roast goose. Goose were much, much more common in those days. People could keep geese, feed them on the commons. Um, 
You still have a goose fair in Nottingham because people used to drive their geese from East Anglia up to Nottingham or to London. I think in Nottingham you don't actually have geese any longer at the goose fair. It's just fairground rides. But um, And people used to yeah drive the geese from the East Anglia to Nottingham, London, other cities. Or they might be raised in a kind of suburban garden. And um, if you think that William Cobbett in about 1820, his suburban garden was where the site of uh, High Street Kensington tube station is now, you know, so it's actually not that suburban and it's pretty big. And so he talks about raising geese and how easy it is just to kind of feed them a parcel of lettuces every, you know, every now and again. And that's what people did. They joined goose clubs. They paid a little bit of money to the publican, probably. And uh, at the end of the year, they would have a goose for their family. And it, it was a very important thing. But what your question really raises is the significance of the Cratchits are going to have a goose. Uh, but what t- uh, Scrooge gives them, the reformed Scrooge, after he's, he's had his nightly visions, he gives them a turkey. Mm-hmm. And the turkey is a thing that's coming in and being the kind of big, meaty, quite grand gift or thing that you buy yourself. Um for the kind of middle classes. Right. And I think it has a, it has quite an important sort of status. It has quite a status in Dickens's letters. You know, he writes a couple of times to, to thank people for giving him a turkey. And is it that status? Because that's what I've always found intriguing, the fact that the fact that turkey becomes, you know, Dickens's favoured meat. I mean, given that the middle class were aspiring to roast beef, as you say, it's sort of struck me, well, why didn't Scrooge come with a big roast beef for everyone? You know, why, why was turkey sort of seen as the best meat, um, in Dickens' eyes at least? It's such an interesting question. And I think, um, I think there's probably this sense that uh, turkey was a sort, of, a sort of goose on steroids. <laughs> you know, it was the sort of the next best thing mm. up. Um, it might have been slightly a pragmatic sense because there was all kinds of other, there's quite a lot of pressure on roast beef in Victorian times. Beef was used for the Navy, for the army. You had to salt it. You had to, you know, feed all those soldiers in the Crimean War and all the rest of it. And it might have been a kind of pragmatic response that we needed to slightly widen our kind of intake of kind of animal protein. Um, and the turkey was, you know... Turkey always had an image of being not the sort of grandest food. It was a farmyard fowl, um, but it definitely was kind of one up from a goose. Mm. Um, but it's quite why he uses it instead of beef. Uh, I think it's probably just, it's a kind of, inter, you know, it's a one round solid thing. Mm. And it's a kind of interchange. And it's very much something that happens in that period in Victorian times. People get quite excited about their turkey. Yeah, and I suppose even today, you know, you think when it comes to Christmas and the huge bird comes into the kitchen, yes. it's quite exciting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So if we think then, I mean, you, you've told us beautifully about sort of the different meats that people would eat, but what about then on Christmas Day? Families would gather together, they'd have a meal as we do, and what sort of meals would they be eating? I mean, we have, you know, roast turkey, pigs in blankets, all the potatoes and gravy, you know, we, there's quite a, uh, I suppose, a, a set understanding of what people would eat at Christmas now. Was that the same before turkey became the big thing? I think it was much wider. Um, and actually Dickens answers that question of what people used to eat at Christmas before he kind of fixes it for us all. Uh, he answers that himself in a couple of ways. One is in Great Expectations when Pip has has given away a pork pie and some mincemeat to the convict Magwitch and is sitting at Christmas dinner feeling absolutely terrified that he's going to be discovered. And he says, we were to have a superb dinner consisting of a leg of pickled pork and greens and a pair of roast stuffed fowls. A handsome mince pie had been made yesterday morning, which accounted for the mincemeat not being missed, and the pudding was already on the boil. And I think that's a lovely description of a rural Christmas feast. So they're having pickled pork. And pork was often, pork doesn't keep as well mm-hmm. as other meat. It goes off quite quickly. And so it's often turned into bacon or ham or pickled um, some way, you know, with salt or vinegar or something. Um, and that's why the pork pie in Great Expectations is so significant because it's a, probably the last bit of fresh meat gets turned in of the year, mm-hmm. gets turned into a pork pie. 
And Mr. Pumblechook's pork pie is magnificent because they're probably not going to have a pork pie until after Easter again. Or they might, you know, they might not. It's not something you just go to the shop and replace. It does have a kind of very seasonal, um, you know, kind of status. And even, and this changed through the century, but there was still this sense agriculturally that you had to let animals be during Lent, let them reproduce, have the next livestock, don't drink their milk because they need it for their calves. Mm. Because if you take that food, you won't have more livestock for next year. And that's why Lent is such an important sort of part of the kind of Christian year, but also part of the agricultural year. Mm. And of course that changes as we have imports and freezers and different ways of farming. But really fascinating that you've got these kind of almost ancient sort of rituals of the year that are that very ecological, you know, and you think actually very sustainable in yes. a way that, you know, we're yes. always trying to get back to nowadays. Yes. It's really interesting yeah. to, to that's hear it. about. Yes, that's true. But of course, no Christmas is complete without your, your festive tipple. Um, and I wonder, what would people have drunk? One of the things that uh, really comes through in Pickwick papers is booze. And it's a fantastically kind of riotous kind of series of kind of, you know, young celebrations. And they go from pub to pub to picnic to celebration. And one of the loveliest celebrations is the one at Old Wardles at Christmas. And this, again, is a kind of pre-Christmas carol Christmas. It's um, a big community of people it's the poor relations it's the servants old wardle says you know this is what we do our invariable custom replied mr wardle everybody sits down with us on christmas eve as you see them now servants and all and here we wait until the clock strikes 12 to usher christmas in and um one of the things that he serves is wassail and wassail was a really important sort of ceremonial drink. It would be served in a huge bowl. It's mulled wine, not, not probably not wine, but it's probably mulled ale or mulled cider. It often has uh, apples in it. And again, there's this great description of old Wardle's wassail. He says, um, fill up, cried Wardle. It will be two hours good before you see the bottom of the bowl through the deep, rich colour of the wassail. Fill up all round and now for the song. And um, there's a description that Dickens gives later. He talks about the mighty bowl of wassail, something smaller than an ordinary wash house copper, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look and a jolly sound that were perfectly irresistible. <laughs> and I love that you see the kind of the wash house copper mm. is, that we're so familiar from um, a Christmas carol is obviously being used. And so it's obviously a very potent image in Dickens's mind. Um, but that's a very good description of a kind of very convivial, you know, a big bowl of something that people serve from. And the other very important drink was punch. Mm. And uh, Dickens loved his punch. And he has he gave uh, a friend, a, he wrote a kind of recipe for her. And this is, this is how you make punch. And, you know, the, you need the, the rum and the lemons and the hot, you know, the hot water and the sugar and you need to burn it. It has to be very flamboyant and dramatic. <laughs> and and you see Punch throughout. He talks about Punch so often. You know, Miss, Mr. Micawber's spirits are raised with Punch. <laughs> the lion and the jackal drink Punch in A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, in going back to um, Pickwick Papers, they have cold Punch at a pic- picnic and Mr. Pickwick drinks a bit too much of it and falls asleep <laughs> in a wheelbarrow. I mean, that, that's brilliant. And I did actually, um, the, the, the punch you mentioned there for Dickens' friend, I think is in your book, isn't it? Dinner, dinner for Dickens. Uh, I did make it last year and it was incredibly enjoyable. So I would recommend our listeners go and buy your book and make it for themselves because it's perfect for Christmas time. But of course, the most famous punch of all, I think, in A Christmas Carol particularly, has to be The Smoking Bishop, doesn't it? It's so emblematic. You know, he writes about steaming bowls of punch and it's um, a real sign, I think, particularly at the end of the book of Dickens, of Scrooge's conversion, this sense of, of conviviality that comes along with the, the, the drink. But I've often wondered, smoking bishop, first of all, what is it? I mean, I assume it's a kind of mulled wine. And is there a difference between smoking bishop and the modern mulled wine that we tend to have? Well, smoking bishop, uh, great title, um, was probably made with port 
And that's really significant that Scrooge, the reformed Scrooge, of course, invites Bob Cratchit to discuss his wages over a bowl of smoking bishop. He's offering him spiced port, and port is quite a lordly, quite a kind of, you know, quite an expensive drink. And I think it's a real sign that he is demonstrating to Cratchit that he kind of values him as a fellow human being, as a fellow, you know, working person. And he's not, and because uh, alcohol, like meat, was very, very kind of seen in very hierarchical ways, you know, as it probably still is, you know, the, the working man drank ale, porter, which we might call Guinness, um, and other things like shrub, which is a kind of funny sort of vinegary kind of drink. I'm not sure. Yeah. I've never had it, and it's probably delicious, but it sounds a bit weird. Um and then obviously you had wines, champ- Dickens served champagne quite a lot right. at his dinners. Um, and things like champagne, port, are very much gentlemanly drinks. And there's a very nice bit uh, in Pickwick where Sam Weller is reflecting on what everybody drinks. And he says, I shall drink brandy when I'm a gentleman, and I will be a gentleman one of these days. <laughs> I love that. It really is. A, like you say, it really does sum up your aspirations as much as your, your social class. I'm interested as well in Dickens because, you know, he wrote a lot about booze uh, and he, he certainly enjoyed a drink in his own lifetime. But of course, he's also alive at the time of kind of a growing temperance movement, which I believe he didn't really have much truck with. What were kind of the social attitudes of the time towards drink and alcohol? Because there's clearly a tension there and enjoyment of it on one hand, but also a slight snobbishness on the other. One of the things I really love about Dickens is he is really convinced that the poor have just as much a right to a drink and a fun time as anybody else. And he was pretty against the temperance movement, actually. He sort of mocks it quite a lot in Pickwick Papers, but he writes this quite excoriating essay about gin palaces. Um, And he describes how gin palaces worked and that obviously they were kind of flashy uh, lots of mirrors, lots of light, but probably warm and probably quite, you know, like pubs are, probably quite kind of welcoming places. But they were seen as places for people to get drunk, drunk cheaply. Um, and gin was not at that time seen as a very kind of uh, sort of prestigious drink. And he writes this brilliant thing about, he said, if you get rid of poverty, if you get rid of misery, if you get rid of, you know, kind of cold, dank basements, ill health, then you'll get rid of the need for people to go to gin palaces. So he's saying, look at the the problems and not, you know, gin is a kind of temporary solution to, for many people to poverty and misery. He doesn't, he doesn't think that drinking gin and getting drunk is a great thing. You know, he does describe people brawling on it and he knows it's not a good thing, but he knows where it comes from. Yeah, it's a very human insight and I love that essay because it's so... You know, so many people at the time thought of drinking as kind of the, the moral failing that, you know, if you're in poverty, you're in poverty because you've been drinking. Mm. Whereas Dickens flipped that, didn't he? And said, said, no, they're drinking because they're in poverty. It's, it's very, it's empathetic, I think, which is quite surprising to be written kind of at the time that he was living in. Yes, definitely. And also he shows that drink is a very significant part of kind of British culture really you know we've from anglo-saxon if you go back to the if you go back to the bayer tapestry the normans are all stitched into the bayer tapestry eating their little meaty meal the anglo-saxons the night before the battle of hastings are drinking <laughs> big <laughs> drinking horns and it's it, it's it the english like a drink <laughs> <laughs> nothing's much changed really has <laughs> but of course um food drink um it's you know a lot of dickens is writing reflects on on meals, I suppose, and family coming together, eating, drinking, conviviality. But it wasn't just consumed together. A presence, food, drink was also used as gifts at the time, wasn't it? And, and quite a quite common present to be in your, in your stocking was food, wasn't it? Um, why, why was food such an integral part of the Christmas festivities in that way? People gave gifts of food, and people have always given gifts of food. Um, and it probably goes back to a time when we were a mostly cash-free society. People produced food, and that's all they had. And so a gift of food was quite significant. Um, and food was also paid. Rent was often paid in food. And we were talking about kind of, you know, Anglo-Saxon and kind of early Norman times. 
So gifts of food have always been a kind of integral part of uh, kind of British way of kind of celebrating Christmas particularly. And it's quite interesting, but they're also a very integral part of charity. And um, so for Victorians, there was quite a kind of interesting tension because Victorians were very, very concerned, middle-class Victorians, very concerned not to be seen as sort of lower than their own status. And so whereas charitable gifts might have been kind of bread and cheese, this is literally a dole. What we call the dole starts off as a charitable gift. That's what a dole was. It's a kind of annual gift and it's often cheese and bread. It might be bacon, it might be pie or something. And so the Victorians was much more inclined to give each other foods that had a little bit of status to them. So Dickens, in, in two of his letters, he thanks people for a turkey because that is a food of status and he's very funny about it one of them he says you know thank you so much for the turkey at first I thought it was a fine baby because it was so kind of big and pink and plump and in another letter he says you know thank you for that incredible gift of the turkey you know it's kept us going for days and days we only finished it off this morning you know 12 days after Christmas in a for our kind of breakfast um but also sweet things, I think, were quite significant. And one of the lovely things about uh, David Copperfield is how many sweet gifts. He's obviously thinking about sugary gifts as something that is very much part of childhood. Because um, he doesn't write much about kind of, sh you know, if you, if you love, if you're like me, you love bi biscuits and cakes and things, you'll be quite disappointed in the rest of Dickens' books. He doesn't really write about them very much, except in David Copperfield. And so he ha there's this sense of, childishness and sweetness so stiff so David gives stiff off these kind of cake and sort of current wine I think and they're kind of midnight feasts and his when he goes older and he goes and stay with um his aunt she gives him money for to give the very childlike Mr Dick some gingerbread and that sort of thing they just sort of these sort of sweet gifts recur in that novel in a way they don't elsewhere Christmas gifts and food obviously are very bound up both in Dickens' imagination and the kind of British imagination. And you really see that in that incredible picture of the spirit of Christmas mm. with his sitting on his throne and there's a mighty bowl of wassail, there's a turkey, there's sausages, there's puddings, there's all kinds of things all around. And Food, I think, has a you know it has a, like it had an emotional significance for Dickens, but it does for lots of us, um, and it's a very significant gift, I think. Well, we're coming to the end of this episode, and indeed the end of season one of Inimitable. I really hope you've enjoyed this literary journey where we've try to delve deep into the world of A Christmas Carol and to see how such a remarkable literary masterpiece came to be written. Thank you to all of you for joining this series and for listening along. We will be back in the new year with more Dickensian content. For now, we're going to leave you with an extract from A Christmas Carol, The Arrival of the Ghost of Christmas Present, beautifully read by our museum patron Simon Callow. In the meanwhile, I hope all of you have a wonderful Christmas with your loved ones. In the words of Tiny Tim, God bless us, everyone. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright, gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's or for that many, many a winter season gone, heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne with turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, 
long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state, upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Inimitable is produced and presented by me, Jordan Evans Hill. Our contributors are Dr. Cindy Chagru, Dr. Frankie Kubitsky, and Emma Harper, as well as Dr. Lee Jackson, Penn Vogler, Lucinda Hawksley, Miriam Margulies, and Simon Callow. Thanks for listening. <laughs>